senescence has evolved for a reason. The damage itself is not great, but it's the response to the damage that really causes the problem. Mitochondrial dysfunction, not a fantastic thing, but probably at the levels that happen in, in most of us in our bodies doesn't lead to overt pathology. It's the response of the immune system to that damage that actually causes the problem. Matt, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, you're, you're obviously one of the world's leading experts, in my opinion, and others when it comes to longevity. And we can make a podcast pretty much about all the hallmarks of aging and different type, type <laughs> of topics. So, uh, yeah, I decided that maybe it's nice to have you back and discuss one of more like a popular topic in uh, longevity space over the last few years, which is a uh, sales in essence. Sure. And, uh, yeah, it's quite quite interesting. So maybe we can start. So, what is sales in essence, and uh, you know, how does it relate to uh, aging? Sure. So I think um, maybe it's useful to start sort of from a very high level, and then we can drill a little bit deeper. So one way to think about senescent cells is um, to to start from thinking about what happens when cells in our body stop functioning the way they're supposed to or stop doing their job. So every cell in our body, just like in every organism, has a job to do and different cell types have different jobs. But uh, just like human beings, sometimes our cells stop doing what they're supposed to. And there are then multiple paths that those cells can go down. Probably the most common path that a dysfunctional cell will go down is something called apoptosis, which is cell death. So the cell will die, it'll go away. Um, while that might seem like over time that could create problems, um, in general, apoptotic cell death is a productive uh, path for a dysfunctional cell to go down because we have stem cells that can replace the cells that die. Another path cells can go down um, is cancer. And obviously that's a bad that's a bad path that creates all sorts of problems. Um, and we have some mechanisms in place that protect us against, cells becoming cancerous. So apoptosis is one, they can die. Another very potent anti-cancer mechanism is this process of senescence, which, which you've alluded to. So that's kind of the third path that dysfunctional cells can go down. And senescent cells are cells that stop dividing. So they exit the cell cycle, at least we think permanently, but they don't die. And so they just kind of hang out. And that wouldn't really be a problem except these cells don't only hang out, they start giving off signals that cause surrounding cells to become dysfunctional. And these are primarily thought of as inflammatory signals, although not exclusively inflammatory signals. So people may have heard of the SASP or senescence associated secretory phenotype. These are, that's the signals that I'm talking about, these secreted factors that are given off by senescent cells that largely are pro-inflammatory, although not exclusively pro-inflammatory. Okay. So how does this tie into aging? Well, it turns out that as we get older, we have more and more of these cells that go down the senescence pathway. And that's happening at the same time that our immune system becomes less able to clear senescent cells. So when we're young, our immune system is quite effective at clearing these senescent cells. So we don't accumulate too many of them. As we get older, um, it seems as though the immune system becomes less able to clear the senescent cells and we have more cells becoming senescent. So we have this, uh, this gradually growing burden of senescent cells within our bodies that are giving off these chronic inflammatory signals. And that's thought to contribute to some significant extent to the process that people call inflammation. So you mentioned the hallmarks of aging. Chronic inflammation is another hallmark of aging that can be caused by senescent cells along with several other hallmarks of aging. So the extent to which senescent cells are driving inflammation versus other potential causes of inflammation like DNA damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, things like that is a little bit unclear, but they seem to be a contributing factor. And I think the best evidence to suggest that targeting senescent cells may be a useful strategy come from studies where people have caused mice to um, genetically remove their senescent cells. And we can see when we do that, you get increased lifespan and improvement in several health span measures. So it seems as though getting rid of senescent cells, at least in mice, can have beneficial effects in the context of healthy longevity. Mm. And this is obviously like a 
natural process that happens as well. So like, you know, if you're a hundred years old, then you will have more senescent cells, presumably than if you're like 20 or 30 years old. Yeah. I mean, again, that, that is certainly the dominant paradigm, uh, in the field. And I think there's lots of data to back that up. Um, we don't have, there's a couple things to say that, that make it a little bit hard to have a hundred percent confidence to what extent, uh, senescent cell burden increases with age. One is there's still a little bit of a lack of consensus in the field about how you measure senescent cells or even how you define senescent cells. So in the absence of, of consensus in how to measure them or good tools to measure them, um, we're left with a fair amount of indirect evidence. But yeah, I think the I think that there is enough evidence supporting the idea that senescent cell burden increases with age um, and certainly clearing senescent cells can have benefits in the context of aging that that's a that's a pretty safe assumption that yeah, a typical hundred year old will have more senescent cells than a typical 20 year old. Just for the sake of uh, precision and accuracy, it's also worth noting that um, senescent cells can accumulate in a whole bunch of different tissues and the exact features of say a senescent cell in fat or adipose compared to a senescent cell in kidney or a senescent cell in the brain may be somewhat different. And we don't really know to what extent does senescence itself contribute to dysfunction in different organs and tissues. In other words, senescence may be more or less important for age-related functional declines in different organs and tissues. And we don't really understand exactly um, uh, how that's working at this point. Mm. So, so I guess it's hard to say, like, is it a more like a chicken and an egg <laughs> scenario? <laughs> so like, uh, because yeah, with, uh, I would imagine that, you know, the same with like some of these chronic diseases or these comorbidities, you would have at least in some of them, like a higher amount of senescent cells or, uh, something along those lines and, uh, and having those uh, higher amounts of senescent cells as well, for whatever reason, uh, would also contribute to those chronic diseases. That's right. Yeah. So, so I mean, when you start, and there are certainly chronic diseases where senescent cells have been strongly implicated. So, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a is a good example here, where there are now several clinical trials for molecules that are thought to target and kill senescent cells. Those are called senolytics, specifically for IPF, because we know there's a high burden of senescent cells in IPF. There are certain eye disorders where you have a lot of senescent cells. Um, uh, osteoarthritis is another situation where you have a, a high burden of, of senescent cells. And so it is sort of an interesting question in these sort of disease or functional specific cases. Um, is this part of the normal aging process or it, or is the high burden of senescent cells in those disorders kind of distinct pathology from normal aging, but then may contribute to accelerating biological aging in that tissue or in other tissues because you're getting this high burden of senescent cells in the context of that very specific disease. So yeah, in some ways you could think of that as sort of a, a chicken chicken or egg scenario uh, in the context of certain diseases. It's also worth saying that, you know, senescent cells, uh, senescence has evolved for a reason. So I already mentioned probably the most important reason, which is anti-cancer, but there are also some other cases like, like in wound healing, where we think that senescent cells actually play a functional role to promote the inflammation that you want to see in the context of an open wound. Um, and so there are probably multiple reasons why senescence as a biological process exists. It's just that, um, with age, probably in large part because of the dysregulation of the immune system, we get a much higher burden, we think, of these senescent cells because our immune system is no longer able to clear them as effectively. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. 
Bone Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bonecharge.com forward slash seamland and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. So, so the immune system is like almost like a regulator of the level of senescent cells or like helps to clear them out or... Yeah, that's the current thinking. And I think there's pretty good evidence to support that, that in in young individuals, the immune system is a very potent mechanism for removing senescent cells. And as we age, that becomes less effective. In many ways, that parallels cancer surveillance as well. So in young individuals, the immune system is very effective at clearing early stage cancers. As we get older, it becomes less effective at doing that. And that probably contributes to the the pretty dramatic rise in age-related um, cancers that we see for many types of cancer. I think one thing that is useful to appreciate, though, is there's almost a vicious cycle when it comes to senescent cells. So people tend to say immune function declines with age, but that's really only half true. There is absolutely a decline in certain aspects of immune function. We just talked about it. Clearance of senescent cells, cancer surveillance, pathogen surveillance, there's also a hyperactivation of the immune system, and that's where this inflammaging phenotype comes in, this chronic inflammatory state that goes along with the aging process that is largely autoimmune in nature, meaning it is the immune system reacting to the body's own antigen, so self-reaction. Uh, um, so there's this, this combination of hyperactivation of the immune system in ways that we don't want and reduced activity of the immune system in ways we do want. And that chronic inflammation is contributing to the inability of the immune system to function the way it's supposed to, to surveil cancer, to clear senescent cells, to fight off viruses and bacteria. And because senescent cells contribute to inflammation, they're actually also contributing to the decline in the immune system, being able to do what it's supposed to. So senescent cells actually sort of in a in a vicious cycle way make this perturb the system and make it worse and that then of course contributes to the inability of the immune system to clear senescent cells so you have more senescent cells more inflammation so it, it it just it's sort of this this cycle that run amok and that in many ways i think that encapsulates a lot of what we see with aging yeah yeah and i guess you know if you if we were to ask like where does it begin, then you would have to understand like what causes aging in the first place. Yeah, and I mean again, I think you know my personal view is we are still pretty early in the game, so I think everybody recognizes the hallmarks of aging are incomplete. Um, uh, you know, do the hallmarks represent ten percent of biological aging or ninety percent of biological aging or somewhere in the middle? I don't think we know. I sort of gravitate towards the view that that it's closer to, to 10%, maybe even less. In other words, there's a lot that we don't understand. Uh, and so it's, it, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say with any confidence, you know, exactly how the complexity of the system is, is working. And that, that's why I'm sort of careful to say, you know, to the best of our knowledge, um, this is what we currently think. I, again, I think we can be pretty confident that the hallmarks of aging contribute to biological aging. No question about that how they're interconnected and what the network is that underlies the hallmarks of aging and what else is out there, I think are all open questions. And, and there's probably a lot more to learn that we don't, that mm. we don't understand. Senescence again, I think is an interesting example where, or I guess I should say inflammation is an interesting example where multiple hallmarks converge on inflammation. And so senescent cells are really only one one driver of inflammation, right? So I already mentioned mitochondrial dysfunction. We know that that mitochondrial dysfunction through both reactive oxygen species and release of mitochondrial DNA can drive an inflammatory response. We know DNA damage can. So those are two other hallmarks. We know dysregulation of the microbiome, gut dysbiosis or dysbiosis of the of other microbial communities in our bodies can drive inflammation. So there are multiple hallmarks that are all contributing to this inflammatory phenotype. Um, and the relative importance of those, I think, is going to be context and individual uh, dependent. So, you know, senescence might be more of a problem for you than it is. Actually, it's probably more of a problem for me than it is for you right now because I'm older than you. But for, if you take different individuals, senescence might be more of a problem in one person 
DNA damage might be more of a problem in another person, right? And it, and so the exact balance is going to be somewhat individual, which again, I think points to the need for better uh, individual biomarkers for all of these hallmarks of aging and, and probably even more importantly, the underlying network that that really drives the biology of aging. Mm. So what are like th- some of the main triggers for cell senescence? So inflammation is obviously one of them, maybe DNA damage as well. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, a, a lot of this is a lot of this comes from studies that have been done in the laboratory in cells and culture. So we always have to be a little bit careful to extrapolate from cells in culture in this very artificial environment to what's going on inside of our bodies. But what we can say from laboratory studies is that certainly um, telomere shortening can drive cell senescence. Reactive oxygen species can drive cell senescence. Uh, those are probably, certainly the telomere shortening is recognized as a DNA damage signal. Um, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction can drive cell senescence. Um, uh, irradiation can drive cell senescence. So within our own bodies, and then senescent cells can can at least push surrounding cells over the edge into a senescent phenotype themselves. So within our bodies, the relative importance of each of those things in in terms of uh, contributing to senescent cell burden, uh, again, I think is a little bit uh, a little bit unclear, um, and is probably going to be tissue or organ dependent. In other words, you know, for skin cells, you might imagine that radiation exposure is going to be more more of a driver of cell senescence than it would be, you know, in a tissue that is in the middle of the body and not being exposed to sunlight all the time, unless you happen to live near a nuclear meltdown or something like that, right? So it's going to be it's going to be somewhat tissue and individual dependent, and I don't think it would be surprising if other environmental factors play a pretty big role in driving uh, cell senescence. So, as an example, pollution exposure you could imagine would create damage signals that would cause cell senescence. We also know, and this is something that that I think is becoming um, has become more appreciated in the last four or five years, that certain certain tissues are more prone to having high senescence burden. So visceral adipose is an example where it seems like not only are senescent cells in visceral adipose more inflammatory, but you seem to have a higher burden there. And I don't think we really understand why that's the case. So it's sort of correlative, but but there's that that observation combined with, I think, other evidence from other types of uh, uh, scientific uh, research pointing to visceral adipose as a particularly problematic tissue type for metabolic dyshomeostasis make a, a, I think, a plausible argument that it may be the senescent cell burden within visceral adipose that's driving much of the inflammation that is then that is then uh, contributing to why having high levels of visceral adipose are associated with a whole bunch of negative health outcomes um, in epidemiological studies. Mm. Yeah, so like smoking and all these like Bad yeah, smoking is another yeah obvious example that could contribute to cell senescence, primarily in the lung, but certainly in other places as well. Again, one one easy way to think about it is really because cell senescence is one of our primary anti-cancer mechanisms. Anything that's cancer promoting is probably going to promote cell senescence. Mm. Right. Yeah. So how? Yeah, and you mentioned it already a few times that there is no way to measure it or like not an accurate reliable way to measure it so it's hard to say okay how much (laughs) sales we have and how much would be optimal to like remove or yeah there's there's a couple of there's a couple things to say there so there are a whole bunch of markers that people use to uh estimate cell senescence the the classic one is a a a marker called um sa beta galactosidase or senescence associated beta galactosidase um, that's a really nice one because if you do the experiment right, the, the cells turn blue. And so it's very obvious. Um, the problem is that this SA beta gal enzyme gets expressed in non-senescent cells and the 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 methodology for the color change is very sensitive to all sorts of technical um, uh, details. And so it's very easy to get artifactual results using that assay. Uh, so people now use a whole you know panel of markers. Um, 
Uh, but again, there's really no consensus in the field about what definitively tells us a cell is a senescent cell or not a senescent cell. And in fact, there are even some people out there who sort of who sort of argue that the whole idea that in vivo, meaning in our bodies, in vivo senescence is even a significant thing is overblown. Like there are people who question whether or not there is any significant accumulation of truly senescent cells in vivo with age. And they say that a lot of the markers that are used to call a cell senescent are also markers that are found in activated immune cells, for example. So differentiating senescent cells from um, chronic inflammatory activated immune cells is challenging. And, you know, again, I know that's frustrating for people. Believe me, it's frustrating for me, but that's just kind of the nature of, of science. You know, when you're on the cutting edge of new biology, there are a lot of questions that have to be answered. And, and this is just the reality of the, of the situation. I think most people, and I subscribe to this, you know, fall into the camp where, we feel like there's sufficient evidence that cellular senescence certainly is a real physiological response to damage signals that prevent cells from becoming cancerous. And senescent cells accumulate with age in animals in the laboratory and probably in humans. And I think the most compelling evidence supporting the role of senescence in aging are the studies I alluded to earlier, where people created mice that were genetically modified. So not using small molecules that supposedly target senescent cells, but these mice are genetically modified. If you treat them with a specific drug to kill senescent cells through this genetic modification. And the data there look pretty good that you can increase lifespan, at least to some extent, and improve multiple health span metrics by clearing senescent cells in an aged animal. That's sort of the definitive evidence that senescent cells are, or I guess I should say clearing senescent cells is sufficient to improve lifespan and, and multiple health span metrics. Again, is that definitively proven in humans? No, but I think we have a lot of other indirect evidence that make it a pretty plausible case that senescence burden, at least in some individuals, uh, plays a big role in biological aging. And again, probably in individuals who are exposed to environmental insults like high levels of radiation or smoking, senescence is going to be a much more significant contributor to health problems down the road. Um, and those would be the people where you'd expect if you had a good senolytic, they might see the biggest benefits. So I think that that's what the people who are trying to develop these drugs are, you know, thinking about is what are the right populations where we can really test these things and we're likely to see the biggest effects. Mm. So you mentioned these senolytics, there are these compounds that uh, target senescent cells. So what is like the research about them at the moment? Like, as I understand, there's no human clinical trials yet on these uh, senolytics or they're being done. They're not just ready yet, uh, but what what is it like the consensus right now? Yeah, so a couple things to say. So so again, just to define what we mean when we're talking about senolytic drugs, these are drugs that at least in theory will specifically target and kill senescent cells without doing anything to non-senescent cells. That's kind of the perfect senolytic, hundred percent specific for killing senescent cells doesn't have any effect on non-senescent cells. Now, that's obviously not realistic, probably never going to have a drug that is a perfect senolytic. But what people have found is there are small molecules that will preferentially kill senescent cells and to a lesser extent be toxic to normal cells or non-senescent abnormal cells. Again, most of these studies come from cell culture experiments. So it's always a question, how well will the results in cell culture translate to in animals or in people? But there are some of these molecules that have been tested now in laboratory animals and seem to be at least somewhat specific for senescent cells. Kind of the best characterized, and again, I think still in most people's view, maybe this is a little bit dated, but um, but I haven't really heard anybody in the senescence field say that they feel that there is anything that is yet more convincingly shown to clear senescent cells and have some health benefits than than what what people call DNQ or D plus Q, which is desatinib 
plus quercetin. So it's two different molecules, one of which is a prescription medication um, that seem to have some enrichment for killing senescent cells, less toxicity for the surrounding cells. And again, in mice, the data is a little bit mixed, but overall, I would say it supports the idea that dasatinib plus quercetin can potentially increase lifespan, but clearly there are a multiple different studies showing health span benefits plus dasatinib and quercetin. There are a bunch of other molecules, several supplements that are sold that are talked about as senolytics. Most of that data is pretty questionable at this point, um, at least in terms of the idea that they're specifically senolytic and not just non-specifically targeting a bunch of different a, a bunch of different biochemical targets within cells. Um, so, uh, so, so there's a lot of interest, of course, in identifying more specific, more effective, more potent senolytics. A lot of people working on that. Lots of papers have been published. But again, I haven't really, in my conversations with people who are really experts in senescence and doing this research, had anybody tell me that they're like this. This new thing is. 10x better than dasatinib and quercetin. So it seems like most people still are thinking about DNQ as the standard paradigm here for a small molecule senolytic cocktail. Um, so you asked about clinical trials. There have been multiple clinical trials on dasatinib plus quercetin and other potential senolytics. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and some of them have had sort of um, uh, intriguing results, but to the best of my knowledge, all of those clinical trials have been small you know, really what people call phase one or phase one, two clinical trials. So primarily designed for safety, underpowered to show efficacy. And that's that's unfortunate. Um, I think, you know, there are a variety of reasons why right now in the geroscience space, the clinical trials are all, in my view, disappointing and underwhelming. But that is the pattern, right? People start with these small clinical trials um, where they do not expect to have statistical power to see a positive effect because, and this is a little bit cynical, but it's also the truth, because then you aren't obligated to actually show a positive effect. You just have to show that it's not overtly dangerous, and then you can write a bigger grant to go to the next clinical trial. So I feel like at this point, we just don't have much in the way of definitive evidence in humans from clinical trials that these first generation senolytics have a lot of efficacy. Um, hopefully, we'll have some some better powered, larger clinical trials coming down coming down the the, the road here. Um, it is worth saying there's a, a publicly traded biotechnology company Unity that has been in the senescence space for many years. Um, they were originally looking to develop their small molecule senolytics for osteoarthritis, uh, got sort of a mixed result, I think, in their phase two study. So they pivoted to uh, an eye disease, and they are now actively moving forward with clinical trials um, in hopes that they'll be able to eventually get FDA approval for their sen senolytic treatment for uh, uh, specific eye disorders. Again, I think the model is find an endpoint where you can do a clinical trial, potentially get FDA approval, and then once you're on the market, you can look at other age-related endpoints and kind of broaden the scope of use. Mm. Yeah, so right now there's no like established protocol or anything of that because, you know, I've seen online some, uh, I guess, blog posts or some companies uh, providing some like, okay, this is the protocol for doing uh, synodytics. So like you do it twice a month for two days in a row or something like that. This, those, so this, this is all like not really, you know, established. Yeah, I, I think what I would say is all of these things are speculative and there are different degrees of speculation, right? So again, you know, I, I think this is, un, to, to some extent, um, uh, that's true for almost anything in the biohacker sphere, right? There's mm -hmm. some degree of speculation to almost anything that people are doing uh, uh, that falls under that sort of realm of experimental biohacking. But Having said that, I think that, you know, the companies that are, especially the companies that are selling supplements that they claim are senolytic and then trying to give you a protocol, I, I put that in the the speculative verging on snake oil part of the spectrum, right? So there's really not a lot of evidence, first of all, that these supplements are truly senolytic in any effective way. And then that there's really no evidence to my knowledge that these sorts of, you know, 
two days every month sort of approaches um, are are going to be effective. I think where that comes from uh, are studies in mice where people have done things like treat with these genetic senolytic uh, therapies or even dasatinib and quercetin in a cyclic way. So the the concept here is that if you can effectively clear the senescent cells from an aged body, it will take some period of time for those senescent cells to come back. So you don't have to be taking the senolytic all the time. So yeah, maybe once every, once a month, once every six months, we really don't know in part because we can't actually measure senescent burden. Yeah. We don't actually know how long it takes for the senescent cells to come back, but that's where that sort of concept comes from that you could cyclically take a senolytic instead of having to take it continuously. Um, and again, there's some evidence to support that in mice. I think the bigger questions are around, are any of these things that are being marketed to consumers actually functional senolytics in a human being, especially at the doses that they're, they're, they're likely to be available at as a supplement? I don't think there's much data to support that. And then the other question always has to be, because none of these things are purely senolytics or specific senolytics, are they toxic to other cells? So if if you're actually able to achieve a bioavailable dose that will kill some fraction of senescent cells, how many normal cells are you killing in the process? And again, there's no evidence to my knowledge that any, even in the cell culture experiments of the natural product supplements that might have some senolytic activity are specific enough for senescent cells that if you could achieve senolytic doses, you wouldn't also be causing toxicities to surrounding tissues. So there's a lot of questions there that I think probably it would be nice if we had a bit more data um, one way or the other before these things are being marketed to people as senolytics. Mm. Yeah, it's like you can't measure, so you don't know if it works. And uh, then, yes, yeah, you're like very hard to say like if it's worth it or if you're like doing more harm uh, than good. So. Yeah, and and the other thing that's probably worth saying is is um, a lot of these uh, natural product senolytics are fall into that sort of polyphenol class, and so polyphenols are you know very ubiquitous. They have they have many many targets within cells, and so even if these things aren't senolytics, they they are going to have biological activity, probably good and bad, and um, so any effects that you see from these things could be off target if your goal is to target senescent cells. Um, and again, at the doses that are bioavail bioavailable, that's probably the case. It's very unlikely that you're getting much in the way of, of strong uh, senolytic activity. And because um, a lot of the evidence supporting the use of senolytics comes from studies where people looked at inflammatory markers, I think there you can get confused between a senolytic, which again, by definition, is specifically going and clearing senescent cells from a general anti-inflammatory. It might look like a senolytic if all you're doing is measuring inflammatory markers, but it could also just be turning down inflammation and not doing anything to senescent cells. Um, so I think that's that's an important caveat for people to, to recognize as well. The last thing I'll say here is there's another class of molecule that um, can have many of the same effects as senolytics, but doesn't actually kill senescent cells. Those are called senomorphics. And mm -hmm. what those do, those molecules will shut down the SASP, right? The secreted part of what the senescent cells are doing. They'll block the signals that senescent cells are giving off, but they don't actually kill the senescent cells. So rapamycin is a good example of a very, very potent senomorphic. It is extremely effective at shutting down the SASP or at least part of the SASP, but at least to the best of my knowledge, has never been shown to be a direct senolytic. Um, and so there are other molecules that can do that as well. So again, depending on what you're measuring, it might look like a senolytic, but it could actually be a senomorphic. Um, and that could be a good thing too. Like there could be benefits, certainly are likely to be benefits from a senomorphic, but you haven't actually cleared the senescent cells. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, rapamycin works through many pathways. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, at least in anim <laughs> animal models, it, uh, you know, appears to extend lifespan pretty, uh, pretty like consistently. So it's hard yeah. to say if it's like, a, like this through the senescent cell pathway or something else. 
I agree. And I mean, I think there are multiple downstream targets of, of mTOR, which is the, the protein rapamycin inhibits that have been implicated in longevity. And so, yeah, is it is how much of the benefits that have been seen in laboratory animals from rapamycin come from this xenomorphic activity versus all of the other stuff that it does? Just sort of as, as an interesting ad for the rapamycin um, case on the preclinical side, Adam Salmon at uh, from University of uh, Texas, San Antonio, presented data at the recent American Aging Association meeting. He's been doing a study in non-human primate marmosets with rapamycin, and he showed that rapamycin is increasing lifespan. I think it was about a 15% effect on lifespan, so pretty reasonable um, in marmosets. And so I think that for the people who have been very skeptical that rapamycin is going to work the same way in humans, I think this should add uh, a little bit of confidence that in a non-human primate, at least mTOR biology seems to be fundamentally important for the biology of aging as well. And I think raises the likelihood that rapamycin could have positive benefits on longevity and health span in, in humans. Mm. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think mTOR is also promoting cell senescence or overactivation of mTOR also leads to more cell senescence. Yeah, it it can. Again, I don't know if the mechanisms there are, are completely understood, but hyperactivation of mTOR um, leads to a whole bunch of problems and is certainly associated with a higher senescent cell burden, um, again, at least in certain tissues and organs. It it is a little bit complicated because how we actually define, you know, hyperactivation of mTOR is a little bit tricky, right? It depends on what your endpoint is. So if you're looking at lifespan, then yes, a suboptimal level of mTOR leads to higher levels of senescent cells. But hyperactivation of mTOR can also, if you're looking at developmental rate or growth or reproduction or muscle mass, can actually be seen as a good thing in that context. So it's a balance and um and how we define normal levels versus low levels versus high levels can be a little bit tricky kind of depends on what your what your outcome is that you're interested in yeah and you can't measure mTOR activity directly either like with the well, biomarker you, you can actually there are actually lots of biomark biochemical biomarkers of mTOR that are very specific um so mTOR is what's called a kinase and that means that it puts phosphate groups on known proteins. And so you can actually measure that using biochemical methods, the level of phosphorylation of known mTOR, what are called substrates or targets, or mTOR itself. The challenge there is because mTOR does, you know, a bunch of different things, it's not clear that that mTOR activity is going to be the same for all of the different downstream targets. So you can have differential activation or inhibition of mTOR. So just to as, give a specific example, rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR, but it doesn't inhibit everything that mTOR does. So the level of activity that you measure is going to depend on which downstream target you're measuring. And so I think that's where this idea that you can't actually measure mTOR activity um, comes from. The other thing that's worth saying, though, is if you want to measure mTOR activity in brain, you actually need a brain biopsy, which is not pragmatic in human beings for obvious reasons. Right. right. I think uh, this is actually like a very good point to uh, shift over to the immune system because like mTOR, cell senescence, and uh, rapamycin, they all kind of converge at the immune system as well. So you mentioned it uh, that there's this autoimmune component to aging, which is uh, like a new concept that I've heard so yeah, can you explain it a bit more and uh, how does like, yeah, like these uh, things uh, relate to that? Sure. Yeah. So so again, I think the 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 easiest way to think about the changes that we see in the immune system with age, again, at least at the level that we understand it right now, is um, you have a high level of inflammatory signaling that is coming from probably multiple sources. So we talked about senescent cells. That's one way you can have a high level of inflammatory signaling. There are others, DNA damage, telomere shortening, mitochondrial dysfunction, microbiome. Um, all of those can lead to inflammation. And what inflammation is, is hyperactivation of the immune system. We need inflammation when we get an infection so that that recruits the immune system to come clear the infection. But 
chronic sterile inflammation. So sterile inflammation means it's the immune system responding to something other than a pathogen, right? It's And, and typically uh, that would be our own bodies. So those could be proteins, sugars that are that are on our own cells that suddenly our immune system, even after 50, 60 years of being just fine with that thing, decides, oh, that's a bad, that's a that's a bad signal. I'm gonna go kill it. That's what autoimmunity is, is the immune system attacking the body's own cells and tissues. And so with age, what we see is a higher level of this sterile inflammation. And one consequence of that is that the immune system then is less able to respond to pathogens, to function the way that it's supposed to, which is at least in part why older people are more susceptible to viruses and bacteria and more likely to get cancer, because that's what our immune system normally is supposed to do. Now, again, all of the causes of this age-related sterile inflammation have yet, I think, to be worked out, but we're learning that there are multiple signals that are driving this increase in age-related um, inflammation. And it's it, this might be a good time to just uh, to just say, you know, this is, I think, a perfect example of something that we see in life all the time, but we see it in aging, I think, uh, quite a bit, which is that the damage itself is not great, but it's the response to the damage that really causes the problem, okay? So again, mitochondrial dysfunction, not a fantastic thing, but probably at the levels that happen in, in most of us in our bodies doesn't lead to overt pathology. It's the response of the immune system to that damage that actually causes the problem. I think if people want a uh, sort of, you know, maybe an example of this in real life, like this IT meltdown that we had a few weeks ago, right? Mm. So that is, that is a, the response there is this company, right? That, that is sort of everywhere and they're there to protect us from an attack, from an IT attack, a data attack, right? Right. But but it was the mistake in that company that actually caused the IT meltdown. It wasn't a data. It wasn't a, it wasn't a hacker. It wasn't a data attack. It was a mistake in an update from that company. So that's an example where the protective mechanisms that have been put in place to prevent a catastrophe actually caused the catastrophe. And so I think in some ways that happens in aging a lot where are protective mechanisms actually being the ones responding to real damage that cause the, the pathology that becomes life or health limiting. And so that's one way to think about inflammation is it's our protective response, the immune system in this case, responding to the damage signal that then causes the immune system to think that our own cells are the problem. And it and then that creates a lot of the pathology that we that we see. Um, so, you know, I think that's a that's a reasonable way to think about inflammation. I'm sure that's over it's certainly overly simplistic, but to some level there's a lot of a lot of truth there. And one of the implications to that is if we can shut down that chronic inflammation, even if we don't fix the underlying damage, if we can turn off the response, that can alleviate a lot of the symptoms and potentially um prevent a lot of the pathological processes that lead to age-related disease, at least for some period of time. It is worth recognizing, and these are most of the strategies I think that 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 are being used right now. They aren't actually fixing the damage or preventing the damage. They're preventing the response to the damage. I think rapamycin in some ways, not purely, but in some ways that's how it how it works. And so one of the implications of that is eventually the damage is going to get you. Mm. But you can you can push the lifespan and health span curves out a ways by preventing the aberrant response to the damage or the over response to the damage. Gotcha. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, most of like, you know, <laughs> supplements that people take are like supposed to be anti-inflammatory, like, you know, curcumin or some antioxidants. Yeah. I guess like then the more effective and smarter way to go about it would be yeah, like to dampen the like the response, the immune response or. Yeah. Although again, you want to be careful, right? Because you don't want to, this is, this is, I think why it's been so tricky to find immune modulators that, um, uh, have only positive effects on lifespan and health span. So I don't think there's any question, like we know enough now to say with hundred percent confidence 
that there are ways to modify the immune system that can have positive effects on lifespan and health span, at least in laboratory animals. But I think any reasonable person would say that's going to be true to some extent in humans as well. Mm. The problem is that I think we don't understand, I certainly don't understand the immune system well enough. And I think even card carrying immunologists don't understand it well enough to say with any level of confidence, how can we how can we only target the aspects of immune function that are problematic with age without also doing things to the immune system that are going to increase our risk of infection or cancer, right? So that's the balancing act that we're we're trying to walk here. And certainly if you give doses of rapamycin that are too high, or if you give other strong immunosuppressants, you might have a positive impact on inflammation, but you're also going to have a negative impact on all the other important stuff that the immune system does that keeps us alive. And so I, I think we just don't have a, 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 a enough of an understanding yet of the intricacies of immune function to say exactly where can we tweak the immune system to only have positive effects without having negative effects. And to some extent, I'm not sure we'll ever get there. That might actually not be possible to get 100% positive and zero negative, but obviously we want to get as close to only having the positive benefits as we can. And um, so for right now, I mean, we're kind of using a sledgehammer where, you know, we might want a precision machine tool. Right. Yeah. A few weeks ago, there was this uh, study that uh, inhibited, or in mice, they inhibited this IL-11, which is uh, yeah. kind of immune cell. So yep. yeah, like what are your thoughts about that? And they found like extension in in uh, these uh, animals as well by like twenty five percent. Yeah, yeah. So so I have to first say I have not really done a deep dive into that paper. So I'm familiar with it. I've kind of read through it at a high level and looked at the figures, but I haven't looked at the details. So so this is my sort of initial reaction again with that caveat that I'm I really haven't given it yet the thorough read that it needs. And it looks pretty, it looks pretty solid to me at that first pass. Again, a lot of times I will look at a new paper that comes out that makes claims like this one did. And within the first two minutes, I can look at the figures and be like, okay, there's nothing here. This looks pretty interesting and solid. So the lifespan results look uh, compelling and real. And, and one of the nice things about this paper is they did it a few different ways. Um, meaning they did some where they started at young age had a couple of different genetic constructs they had in antibody construct. They started in old age, saw pretty impressive effects on lifespan. And they also did, I think, a pretty good job of looking at a variety of health metrics. So, so it looks real to me. And the take-home message is that if you blunt IL-11 signaling, you it appears that you can increase lifespan and have positive impacts on multiple tissues and organs during aging um, uh, that are significant. And the level of effect is comparable, maybe even a little better than what has been done with rapamycin, which again is, there's not much out there that falls into that category. So again, this looks pretty impressive to me. Now, I think the open question in my mind is, is this a distinct mechanism from rapamycin and mTOR, or is all of the benefits that they see going through inhibition of mTOR? Because one of the things that happens when you reduce IL-11 signaling is you reduce mTOR signaling. And of course, rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR. So you do other stuff and they they try to make a case that the effects of IL-11 are, are probably a combination of inhibition of mTOR and other factors. But there's really nothing, at least again, on my superficial reading of the paper that that I find compelling to suggest that that the simplest explanation is that this is just a, another way of inhibiting mTOR to increase lifespan and health span in mice. So I think that'll be an interesting uh, path going forward to try to understand, is there more going on here than just inhibition of mTOR? But it's a, it's a nice paper, you know, very, seems very well done. And again, unlike a lot of the data that gets published in mice, this really looks like a strong, real effect on lifespan and health span. Um, but it might all be through a pathway that we already knew about. And I think that's, that's, if I had to have a criticism, it's not really a criticism, but it is, it does sort of limit the 
enthusiasm. In other words, it would be much cooler if this was clearly something different than rapamycin. If we said, okay, we've got a completely different mechanism that has a huge effect on lifespan, I'd be much more excited. It's exciting, but I'd be much more excited if that was the the apparent mechanism here. Right. So it mostly like supports the the rapamycin in, in or into in, in inhibition idea. It, it's additional support for that yeah. for sure. Um, and again, you know, it may be the case that there are things other than mTOR at play here, but I think the likely the likely explanation is at least most of the effects here are the result of mTOR inhibition. Yeah. Mm. Are there any other similar compounds or molecules that uh, also like inhibit the IL eleven? Well, that's a good question. Again, this is not my area of expertise, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Whether or not there are given this new target, other other specific molecules that um, could immediately be moved into the therapeutic pipeline. Um, I'm sure there are people, <laughs> I'm sure there are lots of people now looking at that and thinking about, you know, uh, can they come up with some IP around another way to target this pathway? I think still, you know, given that the effects appear to be as good potentially better than rapamycin, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm around targeting uh, IL-11. It, it it remains to be seen. I mean, there's a lot, of, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because there are a lot of people who have real concerns about rapamycin itself. I think those concerns are largely overblown, but because of the way rapamycin was developed as an organ transplant drug, um, there are side effects associated with with high doses of rapamycin and strong inhibition of mTOR, mTOR complex one, and potentially mTOR complex two indirectly. Um, there's a lot of people concerned about developing rapamycin-like drugs. If it is the case, and again, this is the simplest model at this point, if it is the case that IL-11 is acting sort of upstream of mTOR, um, it will be interesting to see whether or not, as this gets studied more, some of the side effects that are associated with rapamycin are also seen when you reduce IL-11 signaling. Now, the network is complicated, and and I, I just briefly sort of mentioned mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2. Um, that may turn out to be important here because rapamycin is a specific inhibitor of mTOR complex 1. The chronic inhibition of mTOR complex one with rapamycin leads to indirect effects on mTOR complex two. And the current model, at least, at least that some people subscribe to, is the side effects of rapamycin come from that off-target indirect effect on mTOR complex two. Mm. Is it the case that chronic inhibition of IL-11 does not lead to those downstream effects on mTOR complex two? Um, and if that is the case, you might actually have a way to target mTOR complex one more specifically and separate some of these side effects. So time will tell. Again, the data that's in the paper related to metabolic function, um, based on my first glance, would seem to support the idea that the IL-11 depleted mice are metabolically more healthy than the controls. And so that might suggest that you can actually bypass some of the side effects that people are worried about with rapamycin. But again, I think it's really early and you see this a lot, like <laughs> the, the, the quote unquote longevity community gets really excited when a new paper first comes out and you have to recognize this is the first publication. Okay. It's, it's, it is, uh, it is exciting and it's, it seems like a big breakthrough, but let's give it a, let's give it a few months. Let's give it a year. Let's see how this plays out before you know we really start to, to 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 put all of our eggs in this this new basket there's a lot of shiny object syndrome in in this field for sure <laughs> yeah and uh, and even then it's not like more impressive than rapamycin so far so well it's close i mean again it's one study i think that's what we have to i think that that's what you have to appreciate right is Part of the reason why rapamycin uh, has the position that it has, as, as I would still argue, the gold standard for a, a pharmacological uh, approach to, to longevity is because not just because of how big the effect is, but because it's been reproduced in dozens of studies, many different labs, many different doses, many different strain backgrounds, many different organisms, right? Um, 
there is just so much confidence that it is a real and robust result that uh, that 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 contributes to, I think, why it has this position. It, it, regardless of how big the effect is, if something has only been tested in one study, you really need to kind of kind of wait and see: is it reproducible? Is it reproducible at that magnitude? Does it work across different genetic backgrounds? Does it work in different animal, different species? Again, in this case, given the mechanism, I think there's pretty good reason to be confident. It probably will, but it's still yeah. the first study. So I think we have to give it time and see how this how this shakes out. Right. One idea I had right now is that, you know, in, in calorie restriction studies, they're living in this very like sterile laboratory environment. Yeah. And uh, they're not exposed to pathogens and viruses, so they're so. Is do 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 those mice and animals also see like some sort of down regulation of autoimmunity, or is there any yeah. like link to there? Right, couple couple things to say to that. So it's 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 actually it's actually a bit of a myth that mice in the laboratory live in a sterile environment. They live in what's called a specific pathogen free environment. So there are a subset of known pathogens that are that they are not exposed to but they still are exposed to bacteria and viruses it's just it's a pretty it's a clean environment certainly compared to the real world so i right. think the question you're asking is still valid but it's not the case that it's a completely sterile in, environment um so the, i think the question you're asking though there's two there's two things here right one is yes i think without a doubt uh caloric restriction is among the most potent interventions for knocking down sterile inflammation, right? Because it knocks down the immune system if the caloric restriction is sufficient. Um, and so that is almost certainly a big part of the benefits that accrue in laboratory animals from caloric restriction. There's also a potent anti-cancer effect uh, that, that many people will attribute uh, for the lifespan effect of caloric restriction. So there's at least those two things going on and probably others. But the question I think you're posing is if you were to take those animals and put them out in the real world where they'd be exposed to the whole suite of pathogens that are available, along with a whole bunch of other environmental insults, would they would they live longer? And I think the answer is very likely no. They would die very rapidly um, because, because they are going to be immune compromised to some extent. Uh, they're going to be unable to withstand changes in temperature because they have essentially no body fat. So there's going to be all sorts of challenges presented by their environment that they don't experience in the laboratory. And I think that's something we always need to be aware of when we talk about taking an intervention that works in, in laboratory animals, especially for something like longevity and applying it to people. And I think this is something I say, you know, from time to time, and it's worth appreciating. You could have a perfectly good drug that would slow aging, right? Let's say you let's say you had a drug that slowed your rate of aging by twofold, right? So you're going to live twice as long. But if it increases your risk of dying from one specific thing by tenfold, you're not going to live twice as long, right? So it only takes one thing to kill you, and it doesn't have to be aging, right? So you really want to make sure that any intervention that has a positive effect on biological aging isn't going to have an offsetting negative effect that is going to kill you from something else or decrease your quality of life substantially from something else such that it's not worth it. And I think that your question about the the relatively sterile environment is one feature. There are other features of the way we do laboratory studies that I think are are maybe not as important, but also quite important. I think the social component is something we can't really recapitulate in laboratory animals. But human beings, we're, we're social animals, right? And so things like caloric restriction impact the social component of being human in ways that it doesn't impact that in laboratory animals. So just being aware of the complexity of our environment and how that might play into the entire equation is important. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you answered pretty much all the questions I had <laughs> about Great. Uh, senescence. So uh, yeah, you know, next time we'll do some other topic, but uh, where can people find you and uh, your work? Yeah, so uh, I definitely encourage people to check out our podcast. It's called the Optispan Podcast, O-P-T-I-S-P-A-N. Uh, we're on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. We do quite a bit of uh, deep dives into uh, different topics in longevity. 
new papers that come out. We haven't done the IL-11 paper yet, but we'll get to it. Uh, also interviews with uh, scientists in, in the field. And um, uh, it's a lot of fun. So I encourage people to check that out. Uh, I am on X at M Caberline if, uh, if you want to see my tweets, although I'm not as active there as I used to be. But, um, mm. but uh, those are easy places to, to catch me. Yeah, I check out the podcast as well. And you're producing a lot of content, like almost <laughs> one, one full interview, almost like every day. Yeah, not every day. No, <laughs> we're trying to get we're trying to get a couple of episodes out each week. And uh, um, so far, we've we've done pretty good at, at hitting that. And um, actually have a uh, interview that we did earlier this week with Jennifer Garrison from the Buck Institute, who um, who uh, directs their Center for Reproductive Health, which I think is going to be really interesting. We do a pretty deep dive uh, into female reproductive health and all topics related to that. I learned a lot, and uh, I think people will uh, will get a lot of uh, good information from that. So definitely encourage people to check it out. Awesome. We'll put the links in the show notes. And yeah, it was great to talk with you. Great. Thank you. It's been fun.